This is not the highest paved road in the United States. That is a common misconception. It is the highest continuously paved road in the United States, but there are higher paved roads overall. Continuously paved means you can drive up to the highest point and keep on going right over to the other side of the mountains. You do not have to turn around and go back the way you came like at Mount Evans or Pikes Peak or Mount Akea, all of which are higher elevation paved roads, but you have to retrace your tracks. You have to go back the way you came. On Trail Ridge Road in Rocky Mountain National Park, you can drive continuously from one side of the park to the other, crossing an elevation of 12,183 feet and never have to go back the way you came. All right, now that we cleared that up, I just got back from a trip to Rocky myself. Yes, I drove Trail Ridge Road, and yes, it is the highest continuously paved road in the United States. It's also the highest road of any kind in the national park system. I would highly encourage you, if you're visiting Rocky, to drive the road yourself for the adrenaline rush, for the breathtaking scenery, and for the access to an environment otherwise unavailable to you. But because I'm me, the entire time I was up there, I couldn't help but keep thinking how and why. I mean, it's easy to get caught up in the spectacle of it all when you're up there. It's kind of an intoxicating experience. You feel like you're driving on top of the world and you're in a place that's otherwise off limits or inaccessible. So there's this feeling of doing something you're not supposed to. It's freezing cold and the wind is blowing 50 miles an hour and Basically, you're just focusing on not driving your car off the side of a mountain. But when I took a step back and really thought about what I was doing, I couldn't help but ask myself two questions. How did they build this road and why did they build this road? Which if you're ever wondering how I come up with topics for this channel, this is a lot of it. My brain comes up with these random questions and instead of boring my wife with the answers, I bring them to you all in video form. And also, speaking of this channel, this is National Park Diaries. My name is Cameron. I answer questions like this one all about national parks and public lands and protected places from around the world. If that's something you find interesting, you'd probably enjoy other videos on my channel. So don't forget to subscribe so you can check those out and the new videos I put out on a regular basis. I also have a Patreon, so if you'd like to help ensure I do not bore my wife to tears, you can help support me on there and help me keep telling these stories here on YouTube. That's patreon.com slash National Park Diaries. Thank you so much for your support. Let's talk about roads. Roads? Where we're going, we don't need roads. And if I'm being honest, guys, I'm not a big fan of roads. Well, cars. I'm, I'm not a big fan of cars. I prefer to walk or ride my bike or take public transit. And I live in a city, so I have that capability. But there's no doubt that in remote locations like national parks, roads and cars mean access. And access is one of the key missions of the National Park Service. They protect valuable natural resources and they provide for their enjoyment. To provide for their enjoyment, you have to be able to access the resources. Roads are one of the key ways the National Park Service does this. I mean, the National Park System is full of famous roads, going to the Sun Road and Glacier National Park, the Tioga Road in Yosemite, the Cape Royal Road in Grand Canyon, and Trail Ridge Road in Rocky Mountain National Park. Now, Trail Ridge Road came about because of the failure of another road, Fall River Road. Fall River Road is actually still in operation today, but it's one way only and it's not paved. It was built between 1913 and 1920 in response to increased tourism to this part of Colorado and a desire to connect the towns of Estes Park on the east side and Grand Lake on the west side. They needed a route over the mountains. It follows the Fall River before climbing up to Fall River Pass, which is where the Alpine Visitor Center is. That's where it joins what is today Trail Ridge Road. This guy, J.Y. Munson, actually said in an editorial way back in 1912 that, quote, Estes Park no longer belongs to Larimer County or to Eastern Colorado. It belongs to the state and the nation, to the East and West alike, and should immediately be made as accessible to the West as to the East, end quote. So they built Fall River Road, but there were immediate problems. The road required almost constant maintenance. The snow drifts were pretty much unmanageable, 
the grades were steep, like between 10 and 12%, and in some cases up to 16%. The curves were so tight that you had to make three point turns, like on the side of a mountain. Yeah, it, it wasn't fun. Some people were too scared to even attempt it. So in 1926, the park service is like, yeah, we need a better road. If we're going to fulfill our mission of providing access to this park, we need to make a road that's easier to take care of and somewhat less scary for our visitors, but we still want it to be pretty. Now, it's important to note too that during this time period, the park service had this brand new philosophy on road building. People were clamoring to get into the parks and they wanted easy ways of doing so. The park service wanted to protect resources, yes, but they were really focused on this public access part of their mission as well. They wanted to build roads that brought people deep into the heart of these parks, places they otherwise wouldn't have been able to see. I was reading the nomination form for Trail Ridge Road to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places, and this quote really stood out to me about how people were thinking during this time. It says, quote, The building of Trail Ridge Road catered to a perceived public demand, combining a desire to promote the park with improvements. In this era, preservation of the area took a backseat to publicity and forced the park service to compromise its ideals in order to accommodate an ever demanding public. This philosophy resulted in roads like the ones I mentioned earlier, going to the Sun Road, Tioga Road, Cape Royal Road, and of course, Trail Ridge Road. Now, route finding for this new Trail Ridge Road was going to be important. Remember, they needed a road that had more moderate grades and was easier to maintain but still provided spectacular views of the Rocky Mountains. Almost immediately, actually, they settled on Trail Ridge, which marks the divide between the Fall River to the north and the Big Thompson River to the south. Trail Ridge actually gets its name from several trails that the Ute and Arapaho Native Americans used to cross the mountains from their homes on the west side to hunting grounds on the east side. The Arapaho actually called one of these trails Tai'in Ba, which translates to where the children walked because it was too steep for them to be carried. Trail Ridge Road crosses this old trail in several places today, and you can even hike portions of it by taking the Ute Trail in the park, which we tried to do, but were quite literally blown over. Trail Ridge though made a perfect candidate for a road because it has a relatively flat top. I mean, by like mountain standards. It looks more like rolling hill type scenery rather than jagged mountain type scenery, except, you, you know, at 12,000 feet above sea level. And on top of that, as you climb over Trail Ridge, you pass through an incredible array of scenery. You start in a montane forest where you'll find aspens and ponderosa pine. You'll pass through subalpine spruce and fir. Near treeline, you go through the mangled and gnarled landscape of the Krumholtz before topping out in the alpine tundra. So they decide on the Trail Ridge route for their new road and they decide on a couple of important design decisions. For one thing, grades were to be kept at around 5%, with some places topping out at 7% for short stretches. Also, curves. Curves were to be much bigger than on the old Fall River Road. Those old curves where you had to do like three-point turns had radii of only like 20 feet. The new Trail Ridge Road would have curve radii of 100 feet for open curves and 200 feet for blind curves. Much bigger, more sweeping, less three-point turning. It would also not have as many snowdrift problems, and most importantly, it would still give you those sweeping panoramic views of the Rocky Mountains. This was very important for park leaders. In fact, Trail Ridge Road would come to have 11 miles of driving above treeline, giving visitors unparalleled views of and access to the Alpine Tundra. S.A. Wallace, an engineer for the Bureau of Public Roads, a kind of precursor to today's Federal Highway Administration, was a key figure in determining the route. He had this to say about it, quote, the surveyed route via Trail Ridge is one of unsurpassed mountain scenery, high mountains, deep canyons, many lakes and perpetual snow, alpine flower gardens and wooded areas all combined to make a trip over it to be never forgotten. Okay, so they had the route. Next step was to actually build it. That wasn't going to be easy. I mean, this is the highest road in the national park system. They'd have to deal with the altitude, with high winds, extreme temperatures, massive amounts of snow, 
It's an engineering marvel, really. And it was built in like three main sections. The first was on the east side of the mountains from the Deer Ridge Junction to Fall River Pass, about 17.2 miles. This is where you'll find famous features like the Mini Parks Curve, the Rainbow Curve, the Forest Canyon Overlook, the Rock Cut, and of course, the Alpine Visitor Center. The next section was on the west side of the mountains from Fall River Pass to like right around the headwaters of the Colorado River, about 10.2 miles. This is where you pass over the Continental Divide at a surprisingly low 10,758 feet and you'll round the Farview Curve. Both of these sections were completed by 1932. The last section essentially just descends down the Kawanichi Valley all the way to Grand Lake. The grades on this section weren't actually that bad from the original Over Mountain Road, so it wasn't actually completed until 1938. Also, this was not done internally. The Park Service did not undertake this work themselves. They contracted it out to actual contractors who built actual roads. The east section was built by W.A. Colt & Son, the west by the L.T. Lawler Construction Company, and the Kawanichi Valley section was completed by a guy named C.V. Hallenbeck. In all instances, the construction process was pretty similar. First, they had to clear the way for the road, either of trees, whose lumber was used for buildings within the park, of rock, or of topsoil. This makes sense. If you want to build a road, you had to clear a path. After the path was cleared, they had to grade the road. That just means they had to get the slopes right. Remember, they were looking for grades of around 5%, nice and gentle so visitors could enjoy their trip and not be terrified of their car breaking down on the side of a mountain. Although that probably still happens. For this grading, they use things called gas shovels, which today we just call excavators. But back then they were new and fancy and helped to move soil and rock more easily. They also had things like graders, drills, compressors, jackhammers, dump trucks. They were still using horses back then even. You know, your typical road building equipment, except the horses. We don't use horses to build roads anymore. They also had to use dynamite in certain places to blast through rock. There was one detonation at the rock cut where they used more than half a ton of TNT to blow through the rock. But yeah, that's, that's what they did. They cleared and graded their way 4,000 feet up the trail ridge and back down the other side. Construction started in 1929 and the first two sections were completed by 1932. Like I said, the last section down the Kawanichi Valley wasn't finished until 1938. Oh, and it wasn't paved back then. This was a compacted dirt road when it was first built. They paved it over the course of the 30s and 40s until 1949 when Trail Ridge Road became a continuous paved highway from Estes Park to Grand Lake. 48 mountainous miles between them. It's an incredible feat of engineering, really. Rocky Mountain News called it a scenic wonder road of the world and it's been designated as an all-American road by the U.S. Department of Transportation. Now. You might be thinking, well, didn't this disturb the park and its community of plants and animals? Isn't this a pretty big disturbance on such a fragile landscape? Yes. Yes, it is. It's pretty well documented at this point that roads fragment habitat, increase erosion, facilitate air and water pollution, and cause other disturbances. We also know that the alpine tundra above treeline is one of, if not the most fragile ecosystem in the park and the negative impacts of roads are almost certainly exacerbated in this area. The growing season is incredibly short, only about 40 days for the whole year. The extreme winds and temperatures keeps vegetation growing only a few inches off the ground, and the resources available here are so scarce that disturbances can be catastrophic for just about anything that lives here. And even though there are more than 200 species of plants up here, some take up to two years to bloom. It's just a very harsh environment. But there's a contradiction in that too, right? Like, as harsh as the conditions are and as fragile as the ecosystem is, it's still an ecosystem. The community of life here is incredibly rugged and determined. Through all of that adversity, it's found a way to survive. It's just disturbances are that much more costly. Also, side note, this is why it's especially important to stay on the trail in this type of environment. The vegetation here quite literally cannot afford for you to step on it. But building a road through it also isn't great. Like, that's one giant 11-mile linear disturbance. But the designers of the road took steps to minimize this disturbance as much as they could. They built log and rock dikes to minimize damage from the blasted debris. 
they actually removed debris back down the mountain instead of piling it up on the side of the road. They used local stones to blend up the landscape. They salvaged the tundra sod they dug up and transplanted it in other areas along the road. They actually built their camps within the road cut so they didn't have to widen their disturbance area. And this one sounds cheesy, but they actually flipped disturbed rocks back over so the lichen side was facing up. So yes, it was a disturbance, no doubt about it, but the road designers were conscious of that disturbance and took steps to minimize it. According to the historic American engineering record, Trail Ridge Road was designed to quote, flow across the landscape, but not dominate it. And consider this too, Rocky Mountain National Park is 265,807 acres. One third of this is classified as alpine tundra, the really fragile ecosystem, and Trail Ridge Road only disturbs a small portion of that. Now, this isn't to say that the disturbance doesn't matter or to minimize the ecological impacts of roads. Those are still valid concerns. But when you weigh that disturbance against the access granted to millions of people each year, I think on balance, it's a net positive. Because with each visitor to the alpine tundra, there's another chance to teach somebody about that ecosystem, about its value and why it's so fragile and so worth protecting. And not only is there a chance to teach them, but they get to experience it. They get to be blown over by 50 mile per hour winds and they get to ask why it's 30 degrees out in the middle of the summer and they get to experience a blizzard in September. That, that actually happened to me while I was there. People visiting the Alpine Tundra get to see what it really takes to survive in the alpine tundra. They get to see what those teeny tiny little plants go through on a daily basis. And to me, this is the real value of Trail Ridge Road. Yes, it's an incredible feat of engineering, but it also brings visitors into this magical ecosystem that we humans rarely get to experience so easily. We get to experience it and enjoy it and appreciate it. Just be careful because there are no guardrails. And that's everything I have for you. Have you driven Trail Ridge Road? What did you think? Was it scary? Let me know in the comments down below. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more park videos. Follow me on Instagram for spicy reels calling out drone users. Check out my Patreon. I have a trip report and some advice for my trip to Rocky for you over there. And thanks so much for watching. These types of stories aren't easy to tell on YouTube. And I'm grateful to have an audience who is interested in them and interested in parks and conservation and protected places. Y'all rock. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.